If you've played Bloodborne, you've probably spent many hours within the building that is the Grand Cathedral. We visit this location time and time again for boss battles and story moments. From fighting Vicar Amelia, <laughs> to exploring the upper gardens, or ascending the research hall. It's an iconic symbol of Yharnam and I absolutely love its design. Dominating the city with its monstrous size, yet also captivating with excessive Gothic and Victorian elements. It represents the power of the healing church and the rule they have over the city. On top of this, it's also deeply mysterious, which describes Yharnam as a whole. There are other buildings in the game that invoke this grandiose feeling, like the Yahogul Chapel or Murgo's Loft but I think the Grand Cathedral deserves its own dedicated video. In this video, I'll go in depth about the lore of the Grand Cathedral and the role it plays within the story, as well as the Healing Church, since both are essentially one and the same. As they are such important parts of the narrative, I'll basically be covering the entire story of Bloodborne, but I'll keep it as relevant to the Cathedral as I can. Anyways, let us begin our journey. Our character has travelled to Yharnam seeking the famous healing blood. We're unknowingly thrown out of our depth when we awaken to learn that we've been bound by contract to become a hunter and seek pale blood, whatever that means. We're given a lead from Gilbert that we should make our way to the Grand Cathedral. Across the valley to the east of Yharnam, you'll find the Cathedral Ward. Deep within lies the old main cathedral said to be the source of blood. I haven't heard of pale blood, but... That's your best bet if it's anything to do with unique types of blood. <coughs> my first playthrough, I didn't really know what he was talking about. He throws a lot of info at you. In my head, I was like, oh yeah, that sounds pretty straightforward. I'll come across some old church eventually. But little did I know this was the fucking Vegas instructions ever. But it helps to at least give some context on what you're supposed to look for first. As we press on through central Yharnam, we become familiar with the game's mechanics and learn a little more about the world we've been thrown into. A nightmarish beast plague has swept through the city, and blood-crazed townsfolk wander the streets in search of beasts. Wheelchair person explains, The moon is close. It will be a long hunt tonight. Meaning the beasts are stronger and more rampant than normal due to the unusually close proximity of the moon driving them even wilder. With talks of there being a so-called healing church further into Yharnam, it's natural to assume that this might be a safeguarded area or a haven we can take refuge in. And most importantly, we're following up on the clue Gilbert gave us that we might find some answers as to what pale blood is. This is a damn curse! We all know who's at fault. We know precisely who. A small note left in a house explains that the great bridge leading to Cathedral Ward has been sealed off. The wording implies betrayal, as the person states the Healing Church left us. In reality, they closed off the bridge not only to prevent the scourge spreading to them, but also because they were dealing with their own severe issues, such as church members turning into the most horrid beasts. Once we reach the Great Bridge, we're given our first clear and deliberate view of the Grand Cathedral. In true FromSoft fashion, it's a gorgeous vista that we've earned by running the gauntlet of Central Yharnam, which can be a tough area, especially for new players. It's a chance to catch our breath and orient ourselves a bit. We're higher than where we started and have travelled quite a distance to get here. 
This now marks three instances so far where our attention is purposely directed to the cathedral. As we travel through Central Yarn and we hear the bell ring, we're told about it through Gilbert, and now we're shown the building itself. It's clear at this stage that the developers really want us to question what this tower in the distance is. It's also quite fitting that here we fight the Cleric Beast, a high-ranking member of the church while being watched over by the Grand Cathedral, the very place it came from. And now we jump to Erden Chapel. The orphanage has become visible, as well as the towering research hall behind the Astral Clock Tower. Both of these can't be seen from the Great Bridge, as they simply aren't loaded in until this level. And also the workshop is off to the right, so we have these three key buildings all serving their own parts in the story, and kind of representing some of the different factions of Bloodborne. Stepping out of the chapel for the first time, I got this feeling of, okay, now I'm in the important part of town. Before we press on, I'd like to detour and talk about Old Yarnum. Both New and Old Yarnum are laid out in a similar fashion. All the way down at Pals Arena, we can walk through a different entrance to access the lowest part of the town, which is probably the poor area, as it's right next to sewer channels and they have dirt roads. Oh, the ghetto! The ghetto! But these dwellings still look super cool and ornate. I would live here. I wouldn't even care about being munched by a wolf person. Looking up, there's a familiar sight. A large clock tower that looms over us, with an astral dial. This is known as Jura's Tower, but obviously it's the astral clock tower of Old Yarnum most likely built for the early beginnings of the Healing Church. We see in many movies or other pieces of media that back in the Middle Ages or the poor times or whatever, that churches were not only a place of gathering, but normally the most defensible structures in a village that could be fortified during an attack as a last stand. Jura has set up post on his town's church tower to stand against outside threats like us. I've already mentioned this, but I want to say it again, I think it's amazing storytelling that the church blocked off the cathedral ward, because they're preventing their townsfolk from coming to them for aid, and it really highlights their true nature in how they view their people. They're abandoning them, just like they did to the people of Old Yarnum. Built directly on top of the old is current day Yarnum. Its lowest areas are the dry docks, which connect onto the sewer canals. All the way down here we can stand right behind the church of the Good Chalice, getting a good view of it just by where we fight the giant pig. Outside Yosefka's clinic you can also peer down into the valley and see the church which gives an idea of just how high we are compared to the town below. This act of physically reaching higher and higher complements the story. Old Yarnum as a whole teaches us that Yarnumites have expanded the city out of the valley, reaching closer towards the sky and cosmos, most likely at the command of Lawrence. Nothing will stand in the way of their great aspirations. However, cracks begin to appear in the reputation of the Healing Church when they decide to burn down the old town without remorse. Continuing on with our main journey. Eventually we travel down the main alleyway that's featured in the game's opening cutscene. Here's another instance where the cathedral is positioned right in front of us, its tremendous size becoming apparent as we are now so close. We finally arrive, not knowing what to expect. Hopefully finding some friendly NPCs to help us, but to no surprise, we walk into a large chamber that looks mysteriously like a boss room. As we approach a stranger, the faint utterings of a prayer can be heard. Unfortunately for us, she transforms into a vicious beast. And tragically, we're forced to fight the goodest of doggos, the bestest girl, Vicar Amelia. Aha.
We then spend a chunk of the game away from the main city and venture out to other locations. We're introduced to the idea of Great Ones, the origins of healing blood, and other groups involved in this great calamity, like the Church Choir or Bergenworth Scholars. Each key group was created when their founding members branched off from each other long ago, pursuing their own dark ambitions. Depending on how you struggle with the game's difficulty, these outer areas can be quite the challenge. I racked up many hours in the Forbidden Woods alone. But I also like to take my time and soak up the surroundings because they're always so well designed. FromSoft really know how to immerse you in their little worlds that truly feel lived in. Despite pretty much everyone in this region having mysteriously vanished or straight up died, the areas still seem filled with life and culture. I don't think I can make another video like this with most other games out there. The visuals in Bloodborne are so stunning and interesting to look at. Whereas most games feature like bland copy-pasted assets or just have you running through boring ass corridors. When you enter Hemwick Channel Lane, you're stepping into a hamlet that's filled with crazy old hag ladies who are clearly on some weird shit and they're happy living in their little shanties. Or in Kanehurst, it's a totally new environment with snow and vampires. The castle's actual footprint is relatively small, but there's so much to explore. This is our first big introduction to the Great Ones, when we see the giant, organic-looking tombstones scattered about. As we exit the woods to see Bergenworth, a sense of, ah, oh, finally, somewhere more civilised, washed over me the first time I saw it. It's overrun with alien bug creatures, but it's nice to be advancing in the story and visiting a new area. Here is where it becomes certain that crazy stuff is happening, much more than just blood and beats. Rom is vanquished, and the Mensis ritual is no longer hidden. The true horrific nature of the world is now revealed to us. While we're at a midway point in the story, I'd like to quickly mention that I'm in the process of making two more videos. One where I detail the actual model of this building and how its appearance changes drastically throughout the game, and another where I discuss how I made this rendition of the cathedral from scratch using voxels. Now moving on with our journey. We tackle the village of body horror, Yahagul, and learn the next step for our player character. To silence the cries of a newborn, and end a nightmarish ritual that beckons the moon. Deep in Yahagul, we can find the key for a door at the peak of the workshop, leading to the upper cathedral ward. This gives us a chance to diverge from our main quest, and uncover some of the darkest secrets hidden by the choir and church. We return to the tainted beating heart of Yarnum, the Grand Cathedral, filled with new insights gained by exploring the fringe areas of Yarnum. Into the orphanage, we find nothing but madness, beasts, and kin of the cosmos, as well as child-sized coffins. Leaving this dreadful place and crossing the bridge leads to the Lumen Flower Gardens in the upper levels of the cathedral, which is highly inaccessible to everyday Yarnamites. The Celestial Emissary and its friends happily welcome us to their garden. 
Smashing through the window and traveling to the rear, we stumble upon the altar of despair, deep below the building. By this point, pretty much every character related to the healing church, choir, workshop, or school of Mensis has either died, transformed, or gone mad. Don't you see how they writhe, writhe inside my head? It's rather rapturous. <laughs> We learn of all these horrible events that occurred, and yet, all that really remains are these silent buildings where everything began. They've witnessed everything that is unfurled. They're no longer places of worship or great discovery, but now holders of dark secrets that would have remained hidden if it weren't for the actions of our moon-centered hunter. With the has gone, there remains no more original inhabitants of the cathedral in the waking world. It becomes eerily quiet. They reached too high, and the price they paid were the lives of practically the entire population. It can't be! This is a nightmare! What was once a building that represented the power and growth of Yarnum, the Grand Cathedral now stands as an infernal reminder of everything that went wrong due to the meddling of a select few powerful individuals. All that is left are the echoes of pain, lies, and deceit. From here, we enter the DLC to uncover the most well-kept secrets of all. Both cathedrals in The Hunter's Nightmare represent different points in time. In the first one, we're shown Lawrence taking a snooze on a throne. This most likely represents him during his rule long ago, when he began the administration of healing blood to the sick. I'm sure he didn't literally rule over Yarnum. There isn't any mention of a government body in the game that I know of, but it's clear the church has always had the most influence over the people, so he was probably the most influential figure at the time. The second Grand Cathedral we visit contains the most info regarding its history and the healing churches. I love this concept art. It's as though it's stuck between the waking world and the dream world, or perhaps it's falling from the dream layer above. Instead of heading through the main doors, this time around we gain access through the underground corpse pile. Here we fight Ludwig, a very important figure in the narrative. All along. He's gone a bit silly, but he's still a great guy. I really like that he asks you if his church hunters are honourable. It adds a layer to his character in that you question whether just because he's become a beast, it doesn't mean he might have been inherently evil. More so, he just lost sight of his own identity and was consumed by beasthood. My. We move up into a dark hallway, kill a few losers, and learn that just when we thought the Grand Cathedral couldn't get any more sinister, they have a dark and dingy prison level with weird prisoners. Up into the main hall, it's a makeshift sick room. We face these absolute fucking wenches, oh my god, they're so annoying. Stepping out from the elevator platform, we enter the research hall. 
Here, there is a dark history of private researchers conducting horrible experiments on their patients. All these patients have swollen heads from the experimentation of imbibing fluids. Adeline is a prime example. Please, could you do something for me? I need brain fluid. Murky, mushy brain fluid. A former blood saint, she was one of few patients who haven't been driven completely insane. Some are nothing but a head full of liquid, squelching around. Have you heard how curiously the sea turns? Like a storm, but like the rain, only gentle, like dripping water. These ones share a commonality in that they have a fondness of the research hall's caretaker, Maria. She clearly treats the patients with kindness. Adeline mistakes us for Lady Maria when we first speak to her. Eventually, by giving Adeline brain fluid, we help her to ascend her physical form, which was one of the main purposes of the research hall. By helping her, she grants us the balcony key, taking us outside and to an earlier rendition of the Lumenflower Gardens from the base game. Here, the patients are busy at work tending to their flowers, unlike the living failures up above who are standing around doing fuck all. It's nice that they were kept alive and weren't simply killed and thrown away. They get the best view in the whole nightmare from up here. And now for my favourite part of the whole game. We finally get to enter the Astral Clock Tower. From the moment I saw this structure, I wanted to see what was behind that damn clock face. Of course, we also get to meet our queen, our icon, our girl boss, the Lady Maria. And here is where our journey begins to come to a close. Where we soon delve into the darker secrets. By conquering Lady Maria, the Astral Clock Tower reveals its secrets to us that have been kept long hidden by Maria. A place that should have been left well alone. Walking through the clock face, we're stepping back even further through time. Here we can only see the top of the Grand Cathedral. It sticks very much out of place compared with its surroundings. Now it almost looks like the bow of a huge ship that's anchored offshore while its crew members invade the hamlet in search of something. The innocent local population, while hideously deformed, were living harmoniously with the parasites found within Cos until their unique existence became known by the Bergenworth scholars and early church members, who decided to ravage the population. Despite her lifeless body resting on the beach, Koz's presence still lingers. The hunters were branded with a curse by the wrath of Mother Koz, 
for violating her body, her unborn childs, and the people of the village. This curse pulls the hunters into the nightmare when they're too drunk with blood. A branding that will torment them for countless generations to come. The hunter's curse and Maria's suicide after ravaging the seafood people should have been the first lessons learned by the scholars. By the gods, fear it, Lawrence. That what they're doing is inhumane and there should be limits as to the lengths they'll go purely for research. Listen, Klaus. And you too will hear the sound of water. But these events took place early in the story. Obviously, they didn't learn their lesson. Continuing to push boundaries in order to gain valuable, juicy insight. The research hall may have become inoperational after the death of Maria, as the elevator was removed and experimentation moved over to a newly built orphanage. And a familiar pattern occurs. The church simply block off access to this old area, pretending it never existed. It's business as usual, until finally they're punished again, this time for good. Everything collapses on this night of the hunt. Only an outsider from a foreign land, untouched by the grips of the healing church, can bring an end to the turmoil of this long night if they choose. The narrative of this megastructure is truly perfect. It continually reappears throughout the story, seemingly following us, watching us through our journey. It's almost like we can't escape, until finally we do. We bring an end to the healing church. We leave Bergenworth behind kill any twisted beings left of the choir and stop the Mensa's ritual. Closing the nightmare with the Mensa scholars contained within. Last of all, the hunter's curse is lifted after we slay the angered orphan of Koz, returning it to the bottomless sea. All that remains is a damaged Yarnum, waiting for the sunrise, waiting for a new day. Before I go, I'd like to add, FromSoft have a formula to their games that I love so much. You're always working your way towards something visually, and it's so satisfying when you reach it and can say, I'm finally here. There's always a landmark in the distance that makes you say, oh cool, what's that? I want to go there. I'll put a link in the description for the credits of Bloodborne, because these amazing artists should be known. We wouldn't have the game we know and love without them. I hope this video gave you a newfound appreciation for the environments in Bloodborne if you didn't love them already, along with the other Soulsborne games. Thank you so much for watching, and if you have any questions or like anything be sure to comment because I love talking about this game, especially about the Grand Cathedral, obviously. So, Also, one last thing just before I go. We just fired the, um, the person that does that, but now you have been promoted. You are now one of my elite employees. Uh, you missed some trash over there, honey. All right.